Jesus explained the truth about the kingdom of Satan. Jesus accused. Imagine this. Jesus is going about his business, doing his usual routine of teaching, healing people, and basically being the one everyone either loves or is puzzled by. Then, one day, he comes across a man who is demon-possessed, blind, and mute. Now, that's a tough situation for anyone, right? Jesus being Jesus heals the man. You'd think everyone would be thrilled, but no, not everyone. Here's where things take a twist. The Pharisees, a group of religious leaders, see this and instead of being amazed, they accuse Jesus of something that is to be considered a serious allegation. But the Pharisees heard it and said, this man casts out demons only by the help of Beelzebub, Satan, the prince of the demons. Matthew chapter 12, verse 24. Beelzebub, by the way, is another name for Satan. So basically, they're saying Jesus is teaming up with Satan to do his miracles. What an accusation, right? Beelzebub means literally Lord of Flies. Satan's title, particularly as the ruler over demons, because the demons are compared to the whole insect domain. Why would they even say that? Here's some context. The Pharisees were kind of like the religious elite. They were supposed to be the good people, teaching people about God. But when Jesus came along, doing things they couldn't and drawing big crowds, they felt threatened. Instead of seeing the good in what Jesus was doing, they got all defensive and tried to discredit him. It's like when someone gets so jealous that they start spreading rumors to make themselves look better. Jesus on the kingdom of Satan. Jesus, however, isn't going to accept their accusations. He challenges them with some really clever responses. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, any kingdom that is divided against itself is being laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will continue to stand. If Satan casts out Satan, that is, his demons, he has become divided against himself and disunited. How then will his kingdom stand? Matthew chapter 12, verses 25 through 26. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He flips the script and says that if he's casting out demons by God's spirit, then that's proof that God's kingdom is right there in front of them. But if it is by the spirit of God that I cast out the demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you before you expected it. Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. Jesus is pointing out that the accusation against him doesn't make sense. He explains that if he were using Satan's power to get rid of demons, it would be as if Satan was working against himself. This would mean Satan's kingdom is destroying itself from within. So, Jesus used this opportunity to teach the fact that unity is strength and division leads to downfall. Imagine you're playing on a soccer team and halfway through the game, your teammates start arguing and playing against each other instead of the opposing team. It's pretty obvious that your team wouldn't stand a chance of winning, right? That's basically what Jesus was getting at with his statement. This story isn't just about a clash between Jesus and some jealous leaders. It's deeper than that. It's about how people can sometimes be so blinded by their own beliefs or jealousy that they can't see the good in front of them. Ever seen someone refuse to admit they're wrong, even when the truth is staring them in the face? This was the same situation in the case of Jesus and the religious leaders. It also shows us something about Jesus' character. He's not just some miracle worker showing off. He's there to bring change, to challenge the status quo, and to show what God's kingdom really looks like, a place of healing, truth, and no room for evil. This applies not just to the spiritual realm, but also to our daily lives, in our families, communities, and even nations. Jesus' work is distinct from Satan's. The devil destroys, but the deliverer rescues. Whereas Satan weakens life, Jesus strengthens it. Whereas Satan binds, Jesus frees. Jesus demonstrates how his work exalts life. Jesus now goes on the offensive and declares with two scathing denunciations of the Pharisees the consequences of those who oppose his messianic ministry. First, Jesus begins by throwing down the gauntlet. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. There is no middle ground with Jesus. Either he is or he isn't the Messiah. Because the Pharisees have already established that he is not, they will oppose him as they have shown. 
This saying, however, has a lot of meaning for everyone who hears it. The multitudes have been given numerous chances to repent and enter the kingdom, but their window of opportunity is closing fast. Refusing to make a positive decision for Jesus is already a decision against him. The problem is that many in the multitude will eventually succumb to the religious leader's persuasion and join them in demanding Jesus' death. The Pharisees have been mounting blasphemy charges against Jesus. Still, now Jesus shows that all of their charges are blasphemy. And so I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Rejection of Jesus' ministry as validated by the Spirit is the same sort of defiant, deliberate sin. By attributing the work and power of the Spirit to Satan, the Pharisees are displaying the highest dishonor to God. To reject the evidence of exorcisms and healings and miracles is to reject the kingdom's offer of forgiveness of sins. As long as the Pharisees continue to reject that evidence, they cannot enter the kingdom and receive forgiveness. The kingdom of Satan explained. What exactly is the kingdom of Satan? In the Bible, this term is used to describe the spiritual domain over which Satan, the adversary and enemy of God, reigns. It's depicted as the opposite of God's kingdom, a place where lies, deceit, and rebellion against God's will are the norm. Think of it as the dark shadow to God's light, a realm where everything that stands against goodness and truth finds a home. Satan has a highly organized kingdom. In that kingdom, there are various areas and levels of authority. The headquarters of this kingdom is in the heavenly regions. That is a staggering fact, but it is quite clear. The fact that Satan heads a highly organized kingdom astonishes some people, yet there are many clear indications of this in the Bible. Satan's kingdom also consists of demons. Jesus then says, now when the unclean spirit comes out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they come in and live there. And the last condition of that person becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation. Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45. In context, the primary point of Jesus was not upon principles of demon possession, and he explained the seriousness of rejecting him as entirely as the religious leaders had. Jesus gives a parabolic revelation of the warfare within that adulterous generation. The incident of the demon-possessed man who was blind and mute had instigated the entire interchange with the Pharisees. So, Jesus returns to the topic of exorcism to make a final point. Jesus demonstrates that the Pharisees and those of that generation who are following in their footsteps are also under the control of Satan's demonic spirits. Jesus demonstrates that the Pharisees and those of that generation who are following in their footsteps are also under the control of Satan's demonic spirits. Jesus begins with a general statement of how demons operate. When an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. The verb comes out implies that the demon has come out through an exorcism. Demons are often associated with desert, waterless places as their home. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 21. But desert creatures will lie down there, and their houses will be full of owls. Ostriches also will live there, and wild goats will dance there. The rest implies that although a demon can exist in a disembodied state, its evil purpose is best performed in an embodied state. The demon seeks re-ownership of a person's entire immaterial material self. I will return to the house I left my house. That is why it is called demon possession. Demons tend to be persistent in wanting to maintain ownership of a person. So, it goes and takes with its seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. The number seven is linked in scripture with completion, fulfillment, and perfection. Here it may point to the completeness of demon possession once the demon returns. Furthermore, it seems that demons are powerless to work evil unless they are inhabiting a body. 
If a demon could manifest and wreak havoc on humanity, then it wouldn't need to keep hunting for some human form to inhabit. If a demon could just materialize and wreak havoc on humanity, demons cannot take the form of humans or animals at will. When the demons were exorcised from the men at Gadara, they did not choose to be bodiless and instead chose to enter the bodies of pigs rather than becoming bodiless themselves. Mark chapter 5 verses 10 through 13. And he began begging him repeatedly not to send them out of the region. Now there was a large herd of pigs grazing there on the mountain. And the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs so that we may go into them. Jesus gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs. The herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea, and they were drowned, one after the other, in the sea. The evil generation that Jesus addresses has experienced his powerful ministry, especially through his exorcisms. But they had not repented and turned to the kingdom of God. Therefore, that generation is more susceptible to the power of the evil one than ever before. The tragic point of the parable is in the statement, and the final condition of that man is worse than the first. If the present generation continually rejects Jesus, they too will be like a repossessed demoniac. Their final condition of judgment will be worse than before Jesus came to them. Matthew chapter 12, verse 32. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit by attributing the miracles done by me to Satan will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. But I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will have to give an accounting for every careless or useless word they speak. The passage is parabolic in nature, using real-life situations to tell a story in order to make a point. It is relevant to the generation as a whole, but it is also instructive to individuals. In other words, the parable depicts an unbeliever who has been exercised but refuses to come to Jesus and enter the kingdom. Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out the demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you before you expected it. The exercised person must respond to Jesus' invitation to believe in Him as Messiah, enter the kingdom of God, and experience new life through His Spirit. It can be inferred from this that the person in question has not yet entered the kingdom. A cleaned-up individual who does not undergo kingdom transition is more susceptible to the renewed and continuous attack of the demon world, which seeks to reclaim ownership of them. He can be repossessed by the demon and seven more wicked friends with relative ease, at which point his condition will be much worse, and he will be entirely under the control of the entourage of wickedness. If, on the other hand, this individual does, in fact, receive Jesus and the kingdom, then Satan will flee from the presence of God in the life of this disciple. James chapter 4, verse 7. So submit to the authority of God, resist the devil, stand firm against him, and he will flee from you. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Little children, believers, dear ones, you are of God and you belong to Him and have already overcome them, the agents of the Antichrist, because he who is in you is greater than he, Satan, who is in the world of sinful mankind. Paul on Spiritual Warfare This kingdom is mentioned in various parts of the Bible. For example, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, we're told, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. This paints a picture of an unseen spiritual battle, showing that Satan's kingdom is not just a metaphor, but a real spiritual reality that opposes God's purposes. If we're constantly in conflict, whether with others or within ourselves, we're not in a strong position to deal with these bigger spiritual battles Paul talks about. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 reminds us that our struggles often have a spiritual dimension that we can't ignore. And here's where unity comes in. It's our secret weapon. If we're united, whether it's with family, friends, or a community, we're stronger in facing these unseen challenges. Think about it. Isn't it easier to face a big problem when you have support and are not distracted by small, unimportant arguments? 
In other words, what Jesus said about a divided kingdom failing and what Paul said in Ephesians about our spiritual battles are two sides of the same coin. When we're united, we're stronger, more focused, and better equipped to tackle not just the visible problems of life, but also the invisible, spiritual ones. However, it's important to remember that despite its power, Satan's kingdom is not equal to God's. It's limited and, as Jesus pointed out, ultimately self-defeating. The Bible assures us that in the end, God's kingdom will prevail and Satan's will be overcome. This gives hope and assurance to those who believe in and follow God's ways. The Limitation of Satan's Power In reference to Matthew chapter 12, verse 24, Jesus is doing something that directly challenges Satan's control, and he's winning. This act is like a clear demonstration of God's power trumping whatever power Satan has. Jesus says in Luke chapter 10, verses 18 through 20, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. This is a very interesting image, right? Jesus is basically saying, I've seen Satan lose big time. And guess what? I'm sharing that winning power with you. It's like he's handing out these VIP passes to overcome evil. Four facts that Jesus shared about Satan that many do not know. The first fact Jesus shared about Satan is that a liar and the father of lies. John chapter 8, verse 44. You are of your father the devil, and it is your will to practice the desires which are characteristic of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks what is natural to him, for he is a liar and the father of lies and half-truths. In John chapter 8, verse 44, we see a story unfolding. Every lie that Satan tells has the end goal of bringing about your destruction and wrecking you. This is Satan's ultimate objective. It's fascinating how lying and murder often go hand in hand, don't you think? According to what the Lord has taught us, there are seven behaviors that he considers to be an abomination. Haughtiness, lying, murdering, plotting evil, eagerness to do wrong, a false witness and sowing discord among the brethren. The harsh reality is that all liars will have their part in the lake, which burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. In addition, the true nature of Satan is brought to our attention in John chapter 10, verse 10. John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Satan has always been a liar. In contrast to God, who does not lie, we are created in God's image, and God does not lie. In point of fact, if you look through the pages of the Bible, you see that even Satan struggled with telling the truth. The enemy is persistent in using people in anything of this world to seduce and draw us to his deceptions. The Apostle Paul informs us that Satan masquerades as an angel of light, so that what he says and does sounds good and seems reasonable, but it is nothing more than a false appearance. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. And no wonder, since Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. We would do well to know the Bible inside and out so that we can tell the difference between the enemy lying to us and twisting God's words. Satan is the father of lies in that he is the original liar. Satan told the first lie and documented history to Eve in the Garden of Eden. After sowing seeds of doubt in Eve's mind with a question, he directly contradicts God's word by telling her, you will not certainly die. Satan's primary weapon against God's children is deception, and he employs this tactic to separate people from their heavenly father. Many of Satan's lies are self-perpetrating. Even today, Satan employs people to spread his lies for him. He frequently employs charismatic people to spread his lies, as in the case of false religions. His success is contingent on people believing his lies. To deceive people, he has used everything from little white lies to huge lies. In contrast to Satan, Jesus is the truth and will never deceive you. Thankfully, Jesus is also the Savior, and his death and resurrection provide the basis for your forgiveness of all sin.
including the sin of lying. Come to Jesus in faith and humility, and you will find that you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. John chapter 8, verse 32. Flattery and lies are Lucifer's way of doing things. No wonder it's written that he is the father of lies. The second thing Jesus calls Satan is a murderer. John chapter 8, verse 44. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks what is natural to him, for he is a liar and the father of lies and half-truths. Satan retains a great position over men and angels, but with his perverted character as a liar and murderer, he continues sinning and opposing God. God limits his place and power in the universe. The third fact Jesus shares about Satan is that he said that he saw him fallen from heaven. In Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. The context of these words is the return of the 70 disciples that Jesus had sent out to evangelize and prepare his way to Jerusalem. As the 70 returned from their assignment, they were delighted to learn that even the demons had been subjugated to them. Jesus said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. In referencing Satan's fall from heaven, Jesus most likely had in mind Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, light bringer, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the ground, you who have weakened the nations, king of Babylon. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the remote parts of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Lucifer had lifted himself in his pride, but God had thrown him out of his original place in heaven. Jesus' statement in Luke chapter 10, verse 18 speaks of Jesus' pre-existence and the Lord's defeat over the power of Satan in a general sense. The Bible describes how Christians should be aware of Satan's schemes. Be sober, well-balanced and self-disciplined. Be alert and cautious at all times. That enemy of yours, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, fiercely hungry, seeking someone to devour. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. The final fact that Jesus shared about Satan is that evil men are his sons. Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 through 30. Jesus gave them another parable to consider, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds, resembling wheat among the wheat and went away. So when the plant sprouted and formed grain, the weeds appeared also. The servants of the owner came to him and said, Sir, do you not sow good seed in your field? Then how does it have weeds in it? He replied to them, An enemy has done this. The servants asked him, Then do you want us to go and pull them out? But he said, No, because as you pull out the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, first gather the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Matthew chapter 13 verses 36 through 38. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him saying, Explain clearly to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the weeds are the sons of the evil one. Satan is referred to as the god of this age, and he rules over the world and its systems, but his power will not last forever. Lessons from Jesus' teaching Importance of Unity One of the essential points Jesus made is about the importance of unity. The principle of a divided kingdom can be applied to our lives in terms of the importance of unity and teamwork. Whether it's in our families, communities, workplaces, or even within ourselves, being united in purpose and action is crucial. Disunity, on the other hand, can lead to weakness and downfall. It's like having a team where everyone is working towards the same goal. Much more can be achieved when we are united rather than divided. Recognizing and resisting negative influences. Jesus' teachings about the kingdom of Satan also highlight the need to be aware of negative or harmful influences in our lives. This can be anything from toxic relationships to destructive habits. 
Recognizing these influences is the first step. Actively resisting and distancing yourself from them is the next. It's like being in a boat. If you allow water, negative influences to get in, it will eventually sink. Maintaining integrity, practicing good judgment, and staying true to positive values are ways we can keep our boat afloat. The power of good over evil. Jesus demonstrated through his life and teachings that goodness, love, and righteousness have the power to overcome the darkness. In our lives, this means consistently choosing what is right, kind, and just, even in situations where it seems challenging. It's like lighting a candle in a dark room. Even the smallest light can disperse darkness. By choosing good, we contribute to bringing light into our surroundings, impacting not just our lives, but also those of others. These lessons, derived from what Jesus said about the kingdom of Satan, are timeless and universally applicable. They encourage us to foster unity, be vigilant about negative influences, and continually choose goodness to make a positive impact in our world. How can we apply this in our lives? When we explore what Jesus shared about the kingdom of Satan, there are some major lessons that can be applied in our lives today. The role of our choices. In considering Jesus' teachings about the kingdom of Satan, an important aspect to explore is the role of our choices and the two contrasting kingdoms we are presented with, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. This topic is a reflection on the daily choices we make and their spiritual significance. Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 12, verses 25 through 26, offer a deeper insight into the nature of the spiritual realms we interact with through our choices. The Bible presents two distinct kingdoms, one of God and the other of Satan. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus contrasts these kingdoms succinctly. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Here, the thief often interpreted as Satan represents the destructive and deceptive nature of Satan's kingdom. On the other hand, Jesus shows us the kind, honest, and richly fulfilling way of God's kingdom. Our everyday decisions, whether big or small, align us with one of these kingdoms. When we choose honesty over deceit, love over hatred, or generosity over selfishness, we align ourselves with the principles of God's kingdom. In contrast, when we give in to lies, hatred, or selfish desires, we drift towards the values of Satan's kingdom. Here is what the Bible says about the ultimate consequence of our choices. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Sin, aligning with Satan's kingdom, leads to spiritual death, a separation from the life and light of God. Choosing life in Jesus Christ, however, aligns us with God's kingdom and brings us into the realm of eternal life, both in quality and duration. This idea of having to choose between two paths is a big part of our faith in Christ. I have put in front of you life and death, good and bad. So, choose life for you and your children to live well. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. Even though this was said in the Old Testament, it really matches the New Testament's idea of choosing between God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom. This shows just how important our choices are in shaping where we stand spiritually and what happens to us in the end. This is to say that each day we are faced with decisions that either draw us closer to God's kingdom or pull us towards Satan's. This isn't just about following rules. It's about the direction of our hearts and the nature of our actions. Do our choices bring life, truth, and love, the hallmarks of God's kingdom? Or do they lead to deceit, harm, and destruction, the trademarks of Satan's domain? The message is clear. Our choices matter. They are the steps we take either towards the light of God's kingdom or into the shadows of Satan's. In every decision, we are presented with two paths, one leading to life, the other to death, and the choice is ours to make. Jesus' teaching is the affirmation of his power and authority is coming from God, not Satan. It also indirectly teaches the importance of discernment and understanding the source and nature of spiritual power and actions the future of Satan's divided kingdom. Now, fast forward to the end of the story. The Bible, particularly in the book of Revelation, gives us a glimpse into the future of this divided kingdom. The devil, who deceived them, 
was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. It is inaccurate to refer to this as a final battle, as there is no actual conflict. The outcome is predetermined, with God ultimately putting an end to the devil and his followers for good. Following the battle, Satan receives eternal judgment and torment, together with the beast and the false prophet. This is like the final scene of a movie where the villain meets their doom. Satan's kingdom, with all its deceit and rebellion, ends up being defeated and thrown into this lake of fire. It's a pretty intense picture of final justice. But why does this happen? Well, it's all about the nature of good and evil. Satan's kingdom represents everything that's against God's goodness, lies, hatred, suffering, you name it. It's like the opposite team in the biggest match ever. But here's the thing, God's team, which is all about the truth, love, and justice, is destined to win. It's not just because they're the good supernatural beings, but because their foundation is solid and their purpose is true. In contrast, Satan's kingdom is built on shaky ground. Think of it like building a tower with blocks. If the base is wobbly and the blocks are all crooked, that tower isn't going to stand for long. That's the case with Satan's kingdom. It might seem powerful and intimidating at times, but because it's all built on things that are inherently unstable, like hate and lies, it's bound to fall apart in the end. Jesus' role in all this is crucial. He came to show us what God's kingdom is like and to offer us a way to be part of the winning team. His teachings, miracles, and ultimately his sacrifice on the cross were all about defeating the powers of Satan's kingdom. It's like he was paving a safe path through a minefield, showing us the way to victory and safety. So, what's the takeaway from all this? It's a mix of caution and hope. Caution, because the story reminds us that following the ways of evil, like selfishness, cruelty, and deception, is like joining the losing team. But there's also a big dose of hope. It tells us that no matter how strong or scary evil might seem at times, its days are numbered. God's kingdom, which is all about love, truth, and doing what's right, has the ultimate power. The final state of Satan. Is this really eternal punishment? Yes, it is. The words mean exactly what they appear to mean. Then all unbelievers will be judged before the great white throne. Revelation chapter 20 verse 15 states, And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. In the next chapter, Revelation chapter 21 verse 8 adds, But cowards, Unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Hell exists in a realm beyond our present realm. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Unbelievers experience ongoing torment and are unable to escape their judgment. The Bible tells us that the judge is Jesus. John chapter 5 verses 22 through 27. John chapter 5 verses 22 through 27. In addition, the Father judges no one. Instead, he has given the Son absolute authority to judge, so that everyone will honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son is certainly not honoring the Father who sent him. I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. And I assure you that the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when the dead will hear my voice, the voice of the Son of God, and those who listen will live. The Father has life in himself, and he has granted that same life-giving power to his Son, 
and he has given him authority to judge everyone because he is the son of man. The earth and the heaven fled away. Earth and heaven flee from this throne. This is not a trial trying to determine what the facts are. The facts are in. Here is the sentencing of someone already condemned. We also read, and the dead were judged according to their works. If people are not listed in the book of life, then each one is judged according to his works. Those who refuse to come to God by faith will by default be judged and condemned by their works. We read, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. Sin's lingering effects have been eradicated, including death. The last traces of sin's unlawful power are done away with. When a person refers to hell, the lake of fire is what they usually have in mind. We read, this is the second death. A Bible commentator noted, as there is a second and higher life, so there is also a second and deeper death. And as after that life, there is no more death. So after that death, there is no more life. At the end of time, Satan and unbelievers will experience the second death in which they will be in the lake of fire. This dreadful situation is one no person would desire. This is why God has offered salvation through Jesus to anyone who will believe and patiently offers this salvation still today. John chapter 3, verse 16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. This is a far cry from Satan's original state. Before he became the devil, or Satan as he is also known, the devil was known as the anointed cherub. His name, according to Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, was Lucifer, which means the shining one. Unfortunately, Lucifer, the anointed cherub, turned into the devil. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 28, we are told about a specific cherub who can be identified as Satan. This anointed cherub embodied the pinnacle of wisdom and beauty. He was a wonderful created being. In the heavenly hosts, Satan held positions of high rank, status, and responsibility. Don't misinterpret the reference to Eden as the one in Genesis. We know that Satan was present in the garden as well, but in the form of the serpent. This is a reference to a prehistoric Eden. The Garden of Eden was a garden of plants and trees. However, in this Eden, the garden is made of precious stones. As Lucifer, Satan was a shining star, the sun of the morning. His privileges should have made him the most thankful cherub. Satan became corrupted, iniquity was discovered in him. The Lord then goes on to list three sins, violence, arrogance, and irreverence. He violated the holy position in which he ministered in God's sanctuaries. One unbreakable biblical spiritual principle is that when we exalt ourselves, we will fall. Satan attempted to exalt himself, but God said he would be cast into hell. However, when we humble ourselves before the Lord, we will be lifted up. We don't have to worry about lifting ourselves up when we humble ourselves and submit to his will. It will be taken care of by God. Luke chapter 10, verse 18. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave his one and only begotten Son, so that whoever believes and trusts in him as Savior shall not perish, but have eternal life. We may easily become discouraged if we only consider who Satan is and what he is capable of. Yet, he is a condemned person. It's simply a matter of time. When Jesus died on the cross, he demolished the devil's apparatus. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Therefore, since these, his children, share in flesh and blood, the physical nature of mankind, he himself, in a similar manner, also shared in the same physical nature, but without sin, so that through experiencing death, he might make powerless, ineffective, impotent, him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. So why is Satan still active? Is it because he doesn't recognize he's been out of business? The devil is running around like a chicken with its head cut off. He's dead and doesn't even realize it. But God stated he shall be no more forever. We don't know much about Satan. He is now a condemned being who will be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone one day. Until then, the Bible instructs believers to remain alert and attentive. The devil wants us to collapse like he did, but we can hold our ground. 
Not only has the Lord Jesus Christ saved us, but he is also the only one who can preserve us from falling. According to what Jesus taught, hell does not have a set amount of time, but rather exists forever. Those who are tormented in hell are doomed to an eternity of torment. Jesus was quoted as saying, the fire never goes out. There is no way out of hell, and neither is there any relief from it, nor any solace to be found there. Luke chapter 16, verse 26. And besides all this, between us and you, people, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to come over from here to you will not be able, and none may cross over from there to us. If you haven't put your trust in him yet, now is not the time to put it off any longer. It is not too late to turn to God right now, but someday it will be too late. Regarding hell, C.S. Lewis once wrote, there is no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this if it lay in my power. But it has the full support of Scripture and especially of our Lord's own words. It has always been held by Christendom, and it has the support of reason. If a game is played, it must be possible to lose it. Jesus talked a lot about hell in his teachings. In fact, we can glean more information about hell from Jesus' words than from any other chapter of the Bible combined. Jesus spoke of hell as outer darkness. At the end of time, everyone will stand before Jesus Christ, and he will separate humanity into sheep, those who display their faith in Jesus via their good actions, and goats, those who do not demonstrate their faith in Jesus through their good works, those who did not trust in Jesus Christ. The goats, on the other hand, will go away into eternal punishment, and the sheep will get eternal life. God the Father blesses and gives an inheritance to the sheep on Jesus' right hand. The goats on Jesus' left hand are doomed to eternal hellfire because they are prepared for the devil and his angels. The explanation offered is that they had an opportunity to minister to the Lord, but did nothing. The damned ask, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? Jesus replies, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Jesus then ends the discourse with a contrast. They will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Jesus unfailingly distinguished hell from the kingdom of God. Hell is the opposite of excellent fellowship with God eternally. In summary, at the end, Jesus wins. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the stillness of this moment, we come before you with hearts open to your wisdom and guidance. Today, we reflect on the profound truth shared by Jesus about the kingdom of Satan. This powerful message speaks volumes, not only about the nature of evil, but also about the importance of unity and strength in our lives and communities. Lord, we recognize that division is a tool often used to weaken and destroy. We see it in our world, in our communities, and sometimes even within ourselves. We ask for your divine guidance to help us understand the impact of division and the power of unity. Teach us to identify the forces that seek to divide us and grant us the wisdom to overcome them. We pray for unity in our families, workplaces, and communities. Help us to foster environments of understanding, respect, and cooperation. Guide our conversations and interactions so that they may build bridges rather than walls. Where there is conflict, grant us the grace to seek reconciliation and peace. Where there is misunderstanding, help us to listen and understand. In our personal lives, Lord, we ask for your strength to resist the temptations that seek to divide our spirit and lead us away from you. Just as Jesus taught that a divided kingdom cannot stand, we know that a divided heart struggles to follow your path. Help us to identify the aspects of our lives that may be causing inner conflict and guide us toward resolution and wholeness. We also pray for discernment to recognize the subtle ways in which negative influences can infiltrate our thoughts and actions. In a world where the lines between right and wrong are often blurred, give us the clarity to see the truth. Teach us to reject the lies and deceptions that may lead us astray and to embrace the truth and light of your word. Dear Lord, we are reminded of the importance of being vigilant and steadfast in our faith. Strengthen our resolve to stand firm against the challenges and temptations of life. Help us to be a source of encouragement and support to others who are facing trials and temptations. 
Let our lives be a testament to the power of unity and faith in overcoming adversity. We also recognize the need for compassion and understanding towards those who may be weakened by the deceptions of evil. Guide us in reaching out to them with love, grace, and the truth of your gospel. May our actions and words reflect the love of Christ, drawing others towards the light of your presence. As we navigate the complexities of this world, keep us anchored in your love and truth. Remind us that while the kingdom of Satan may thrive on division, your kingdom is built on love, unity, and peace. Help us to live as citizens of your kingdom, promoting the values that bring life and hope to our world. Father, in all that we do, may we honor and glorify you. May our lives reflect the unity and harmony that is found in Christ. In moments of doubt or confusion, remind us of your unchanging truth and the ultimate victory that is ours through Christ Jesus. We offer this prayer in the powerful and precious name of Jesus, who taught us the truth about both the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God. It is in his name that we find hope, unity, and the strength to overcome division. Amen. However, while we are on earth, the Bible talks about angels that fight for us. To watch the truth about guardian angels, click here.